What's going on guys? Zuko back with another last epoch video. Hope you're all doing very very well. Let's talk about dungeons in last epoch. Uh, the dungeon system in last epoch is very unique when it comes to these kinds of systems in action RPGs. Um, it is a late game farming system. They have their own rewards. Um, there's a very very good reasons to go into each and every dungeon. Right now there are three dungeons. The Lightless Arbor, there is the Temporal Sanctum, and then there is the Soulfire Bastion, and they all have physical places on the map. Right now I'm standing in the Lightless Arbor. So, in order to enter these dungeons, you do need to get a key. That's step number one. You're going to find keys that correspond with each of the dungeons. You throw them in, you hit enter, and then there's also going to be tiers. There's one, two, three, and four right now of dungeons, and you can see that... There are levels to each of the tiers, the recommended sort of levels in terms of what the monsters are going to be. Level 65, 88, and then level 100. It's different for each dungeon. And then it tells you as well that if you do this particular tier, there's an extra bonus you're going to get. So obviously enemies do more damage, but you're going to get substantially more glyphs or more exalted relics or idols. This little bonus that you're seeing right here on your screen changes every day. So there's reasons to go farm the dungeons basically every day just for these little bonuses. Also, the items, there are items that are locked behind bosses in these dungeons. And certain items do not drop until you get to a certain tier of the dungeon. So, um... Like, there are just certain items that are, like, item level 75, and that will not drop in a Tier 2 dungeon because they're only level 65. You have to get to Tier 3 before you'll even see that unique item from the boss. Having said that, the bosses have unique drops, so that's another reason to go farm each and every dungeon is that there are unique um, drops that every boss has. You can't get it anywhere else in the game, so you really do need to go farm it, uh, which is super cool. Um, each boss ha or each dungeon, of course, has an end boss, and then after the boss is dead, there is an extra reward that you get depending on which dungeon you're doing, and I'm going to go through all of them. Um, the last and final most important thing is that each dungeon has its own mechanic, and it it's something that you're going to have to play around, and it's something that is relevant on the boss fights as well. So um, I'm going to dive in and just show you a bunch of footage of me doing the dungeons and I will talk you through kind of what's going on with each and in, each individual dungeon itself this is me just looking at the tears this is the lightless arbor the mechanic for the lightless arbor is this glowy thing above my head this is a crystal it, it is a light source in the dungeon this is kind of like delve from path of exile if you know what I'm talking about in a way it's kind of like delve your little crystal has a hundred health at the bottom here you can see and it will go down if you're hit by enemies. So you have to be really careful to manage the little health of your crystal. If your crystal goes way, goes down too low to zero, basically, then enemies are going to do way more damage to you and you're going to do less damage to them. Enemies that are in the darkness in this dungeon take less damage and do more damage. So you need to have the light with you when you're fighting enemies, but you need to not get hit by enemies as well. You can choose to actually throw your light in a direction if you want to and um, use that light to light up an area, kill a bunch of monsters, and then put the light back on yourself. You press the D key. So you can actually like throw the light over here, kill all those enemies, put it back on yourself. And while it's over there, it's not attached to you, so it won't take any durability loss. You can also replenish the light source by killing these light dudes here, the amber elementals. You can see I went back up to 100 there on my light. So that's what you do with the light source. That's the main mechanic in this dungeon. In every single dungeon, there are also doors. I want to get to a door really quickly here. You can see on the mini-map in the top right, it is blinking up here. So that's where I know where the door is. You can go to the door. There's always two choices. There's two different doors, and they're going to have different choices for you. This one says enemies drop slightly more exalted weapons. So that's one modifier. The other one would have something different, like more amulets or something. I like the weapon one, so I'm just going to proceed. There you go. You go to the next part of the dungeon. This actually gives you a little bit of a glimpse of whatever the mechanic is going to be, the boss mechanic. So the boss actually has some root walls. They're kind of introducing you to what the boss is going to be all about. And then you have to use your crystal to burn away this um, kindling here. And we're going to see this on the boss fight. Anyway, you do this. You go through another zone. Nothing really to see here. You go through another zone. I, that was me throwing my crystal, by the way, right here. I think I throw my crystal with the D... Uh, 
with the D ability. Oh, no, that was just it following me. Never mind. There's a second door. You can see we're going through, and this will be the boss fight at the very end. So <clears throat> this boss fight, he's like a huge hulking tree, and you have to basically burn the two side brushes, the root walls, by throwing your crystal. Once you've broken down this root wall, you got to throw your crystal in and start burning. I hit all my buttons back accident. You can see I threw it in there. It starts to set the tree on fire. Then you need to dodge these abilities. This thing's actually a one-shot on higher difficulties. I tried to get out of it, but I didn't quite get out of it. I'm pretty tanky on this guy, so I um, was able to survive. But you can see I don't do any damage to this guy right now because my light source is over here burning down the tree. So I actually had to pull the light source over to me for a second so I could kill these enemies. You can see they die much more quickly now. That's the mechanic. So you burn both side bushes, and then you're going to end up going through the middle. He falls down. You walk, enter the mountain. Then you have to defeat the heart of the titan. I was having some really weird targeting issues with my auto attack build here, basically. So this took a lot longer than it needs to. It's very, very frustrating. Lots of cool mechanics going on here. Then you end up killing him. A bunch of loot's going to drop. Again, if a unique had dropped, I would have gotten it right there. I didn't get any unique, so I got really unlucky. Then you're going to go through the doorway at the top of the screen here, and you're going to go to this new area. And when, um, when you do the Lightless Arbor, you're going to have access to this vault. This vault is very, very cool. So it's called the Vault of Uncertain Fate. You basically... Um, he's going to offer you a bunch of choices that have rewards... It'll affect what rewards you get in the vault, okay? The cost of getting an offer depends on the modifiers. Declining an offer will increase the next offer that is given. So you basically want to bring a ton of gold into this dungeon and sink as much gold as you can into it. I, I've heard in the late game that like 2 million gold is something you should consider bringing or more. Something like potentially 2 to 10 million gold or higher. I have no gold in this character. I'm a, I only have like 100,000, but I'm just going to give it a rip here. So I hit yes to this first one. Adds a chest that drops many runes and glyphs. Then I'm like, okay, 4,200 for another one. 60,000 is too much for me. So I'm going to decline this, but now it starts to get more expensive. 12,000 is okay, so I hit accept on this one. And then 88 is like way too much, so I have to decline it. You see how it goes. It kind of keeps ping-ponging back and forth. Eventually, I just start hitting decline over and over and over again because I don't have any money. And it keeps ramping up. Decline, 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 boom. You can see it just keeps going. It'll get to, like, the millions, millions and millions of gold. So you can see how that kind of goes. If you brought more gold in, you would have a much better experience with this mechanic. Then I only got one chest. You can get up to, I believe, six chests in here. Maybe seven. And then it got me a bunch of stuff. So that's what I got, even just for my small amount of gold that I put in there. Which isn't terrible. But that's how that dungeon works. That's the Lightless Arbor. There's a light mechanic. The boss has the light mechanic. you got to burn the roots. You get to go to the vault. That's the first dungeon that we're talking about, okay? Let's go on to the second one. This is Soulfire Bastion. Here's the different tiers. It goes all the way up to 100, and you can see it has its own bonuses, which has to do with the Soul Gambler. So this is really cool. This dungeon requires you to just kill a bunch of enemies, and they're going to give you their souls. And when they give you souls, you get to build them up over time. And then at the very end of the dungeon, there's a soul gambler, and you can spend those souls to gamble items. It is an incredibly good gambler, way, way better than the normal baseline gambler in the game. And... Um, you can get some absolutely incredible items. You can get, like, set items, unique items, exalted items, and it's very, very high chance that you're going to keep rolling those. In terms of the mechanic for Soulfire Bastion, it is this shield mechanic. You have a fire shield or a necrotic shield. You can see I have the fire shield on right now, which is why I'm not taking any damage from this uh, fire bridge here. But you can see if I turn my necrotic shield on and I walk back into the fire, I take damage very, very quickly. My health bar goes down rapidly. So... Inside this dungeon, there are enemies that deal necrotic damage, and there's enemies that deal fire damage. And you need to swap between the two shields to defend yourself. And sometimes you'll be fighting a fire guy and a necrotic guy at the same time. You have to be a little bit careful. But see, I took damage there. Be a little bit careful about which shield you're using, which, which type of damage do you think you can deal with more easily. Kill the guy who's doing fire damage, and then keep your necrotic shield on, then you're kind of invincible. You see what I'm saying? That's kind of how that works. So you're just going to run throughout this dungeon. I'm going to fast forward this pretty pretty far here and get to the boss fight. But that's the way that this dungeon works. You can see I'm getting hit by both of them there. Especially once you get to the higher tiers, it gets really, really crazy. Here's the boss fight. There are also doors 
in Soulfire Bastion, the doors can modify what the gambler has at the end of the dungeon. That's what you're doing with the doors, okay? Here's the boss fight. Again, he's going to make the floor either turn into fire or turn into necrotic. He's bringing in a big necrotic circle. I wasn't really ready for this, so I did take a good chunk of damage there. I switched my shield, and then he switched to fire. This is how this boss fight goes. He's constantly switching between the two elements, and you have to be very, very careful about what you're doing. Try not to die. There we go. We end up getting the kill. And remember, all these bosses have unique drops. So I happen to get one of his rings, Ashes of Mortality. It has legendary potential as well, which is super cool. So not only can you come in here for the final gambling mechanic, but you can obviously get um, items from the bosses themselves, okay? Which is really cool. We're going to walk through the door. We're going to go to the gambler. He's down here. Here you go. You talk to him, and then I gamble a whole bunch of items here. So I just keep clicking on it, and I get a whole bunch of items. There's like... Uh, I if I can just speed this up. Let's just do the speed thing here. Uh, speed. Ah, whatever. I oh, will just do it later. I got it. I got a unique right there. There's a unique. What else did I get here? I'm I'm sacrificing a bunch of items so I have room in my inventory. There's another unique. Oh, no, I move those up there. Okay, so we start doing what weapons? There's a weapon. Got a um, exalted weapon. I got a rare. I got another two-handed. I got another exalted. That's got a crazy amount of fire damage. 287 fire damage. So this is a really, really good way to get free gambling, right? Because all I had to do was spend my one key to get into this place. And now I'm able to get all these items for free. I mean, it just costs me souls. It doesn't cost me gold. I'm getting a bunch of uniques. There's unique with legendary potential. The claws of legendary potential. Like, you can get a whole bunch of really cool items. I think that this might be a really good mechanic for... People who are looking to sell items on the market. I think the um, Lightless Arbor is also good for people who have lots of gold and can like go into Lightless Arbor, get a bunch of items, sell them on the market, and it's going to be really profitable for you. So I tried to spend basically as much of my um, souls as I could, and I got a whole bunch of exalted items, a whole bunch of uniques. I actually got a really cool unique ring, Soul Gambler's Fallacy. This is actually something that I believe drops from um, this guy himself. Uh, actually, no, it's not a drop from the boss, so it's just something that I got from him. I'm not entirely sure, actually, if if he has unique items that are, like, only from gambling. Somebody confirmed that from me. Anyway, that's a pretty cool amulet. It's got legendary potential. That's how that works, okay? Let's move on to the next dungeon, the final one, which is the Temporal Sanctum. This has a bunch of levels as well, of course, as they all do. And the Temporal Sanctum is pretty cool. This one... The mechanic for this dungeon is that you end up switching between two different timelines. So you go from the Ruined Era to the Divine Era, and you can go back again with your D button. This is very cool. It basically means that there's going to be, like, walls and stuff that you're going to run into in here. And you can bypass those walls by switching to a different era. So you can see that this wall up here is, is blocked off. It's actually blocked off in both eras, so that's, that's an unlucky one. But we will find a door... That is not blocked off, and you can see you can see what I'm talking about. That there's going to be moments where you like can't get past a certain area, and you have to use your D button to transform into another area, and then you'll be able to bypass those barriers. You're of course looking for doors, just like everywhere else. There's a there's a door right in front of me. I think if I switch, I might be able to get through this one. We're gonna switch. There we go. Now I can get through. That's exactly how that works. So. You're looking for doors, and once you find a door, you'll be able to go to the next area. I think I find one right here. So you can see it shows up on the mini-map. It starts blinking in the middle of my screen there. And it's not in this timeline, but it's in the other timeline. So I switch. There we go. And again, new modifiers. Enemies drop more exalted whatever. And then you're going to get more enemy damage, more enemy health. I'm going to go through. We're going to get to the boss fight. I actually end up dying... On my first attempt on the boss fight, which is pretty good. The boss fight in this one is Jura. She is the hardest Chronomancer Jura. I believe she's the hardest fight in the game right now, particularly on T4. This is only Tier 2, I think, or Tier 3. No, I think it's Tier 2. I can't remember. But the point is, there are mechanics that she does that you must avoid or else you're dead. And you avoid them by shifting into a different era, which is so cool as a mechanic and a boss fight, I love it. This is my favorite boss fight in the game by far. It's the coolest one that they have made. There are very, very dangerous mechanics on this fight that you have to avoid. Then there's also these enemies here. It says immune to ruined era. 
which is really cool. So I started hitting this totem, and I'm like, what the hell? I'm not doing any damage. And then I was like, oh, shit. I must be doing something wrong here. I'm, and then I read. I used my eyeballs when I read it. Then I'm like, oh, I got to switch. So I switched to the uh, Divine Era, and then I'm able to kill these pillars. So this is a really, really cool boss fight. There's very dangerous mechanics. She ends up just clapping me here. I think it's right here. Yeah. I almost get her. She just slaps me right here. Boom. I didn't realize what was even happening. I didn't see her. So I needed to transform to a different era there, which is what I needed to do. I fight her again. I end up killing her this time. If you do die in these dungeons, by the way, you have to restart the entire dungeon. You're done. You lose your key. You don't lose your inventory. So if you had already gotten some items from your... From just doing the dungeon, then um, you get to keep whatever's in your inventory. But you do have to do the dungeon again. And there's a unique from her, some uh, Somnia. And then once you're through, this is the mo one of probably the most important thing that you get to do in the entire game. This is probably going to be the most important dungeon that you're going to run. The other two dungeons are very good for finding new items. But in this dungeon, you get to create legendary items. So here's how this works. You put a unique in here and you put an exalted item in here and you seal them together and the unique item will pull affixes from the exalted item to make a legendary now the way you do that is with legendary potential so if your unique has one legendary potential it will steal one affix from the exalted item to make it a legendary if your unique item has two legendary potential it'll pull two if it has three it'll pull three so you can make some incredibly powerful items in this game like i'm about to right here this is just like a prototype thing i just wanted to show you guys i have a woven flesh it's got one legendary potential okay very cool then we're going to look at the exalted item that i'm putting in as well this is the carapace here 11 strength 11 attunement 55 percent health regen 171 health i'm hoping that the unique item pulls the 171 health because it only gets one out of four it's random what it gets so the strength is good the attunement is good and the health is really good the health regen is actually fine but the other three are much much better so then i actually upgrade the health regen now we seal it and then you have to switch timelines to see what you get and then you get to see what your legendary is and boom i actually got 171 health on this thing which is the best roll i could have gotten so that was pretty lucky this is what you're going to end up doing for a the vast majority of the end game. You're going to find unique items that have legendary potential, and then you're going to combine them with uh, exalted items, and that's what this dungeon allows you to do the um, in the Eternity Cache. So the Temporal Sanctum is probably the most important dungeon out of the three of them. It's something you're going to be doing over and over and over and over and over again. But I think the other two dungeons actually are going to allow you to find a lot of really strong items like that gambler got me like six or seven unique items just from one run gambling with him six or seven unique items and they almost all had legendary potential so i think the other dungeons are really really good for just acquiring items and then this dungeon is obviously the best for the only dungeon where you can make legendary items these are the best items in the entire game this is what they're for your end game build is going to include multiple legendary items um so you're just going to have to work with this and try and find as many as you can so those are the three dungeons they are very very important to get to doing in the end game they're very fun they scale up to level 100 so they can be really really difficult the rewards are outstanding and they all serve different purposes they have boss drops um, unique boss drops that you can only get there. There are so many good reasons to go and do the dungeons in Last Epoch, and I would encourage all of you guys to jump in and try it um, as soon as you can because they're a lot of fun and they're really worth doing. So let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thank you guys so much again for watching. I will see you in the next